Uh, so just, uh, I asked Dr. Kutz not to give me a, an introduction because I just want to give you a sense of where I'm coming from and why I'm qualified to talk about this. Now, I am not the most qual qualified person in the world to talk about coronaviruses, but probably from the Shamanat alum, I am one of the more qualified people. But there are a lot of better people out there, and this presentation is based on the research that a lot of uh, brilliant scientists uh, and physicians are conducting. So I got my PhD in genetics in 2012. I did something called a postdoc, which is, uh, if you think of MDs, they do a residency at a medical school. Well, I did additional research training at the National Institutes of Health on virology. I worked at the New York Academy of Sciences with a nonprofit scientific organization in, in 2003. Uh, and then I joined Sloan Kettering and became an assistant dean uh, of their graduate school. So Sloan Kettering is a cancer center in New York City. Um, we have COVID-19 patients. I don't know, I no longer do research, but I'm a dean in the graduate school and I help run our program that trains PhDs in biology. So I want to make a couple of disclosures. Anytime you guys get COVID-19 information, you should always look to see what the source or the person who's revealing information, what are their disclosures? So I have no financial conflicts of interest. I don't have stock in any of the companies that are developing therapies for the virus. Um, I don't have stock in the testing companies or anything like that. Uh, my motivation for this talk is really to instill trust in science, right? I believe in the scientific enterprise and I want people to trust scientists. I want them to trust physicians. Uh, and I'm trying to simplify some really complicated information in terms that everybody can understand. Um, I am invested in making sure that the NIH and the CDC do well because that's my career. I'm, I'm, an, I'm an organization that's funded by the NIH, uh, that's funded by the National Science Foundation. So the information I give is I'm passionate about this because I am invested in making sure that science triumphs in this country. And uh, one disclosure is that I was trained as a virologist. Okay, I studied viruses. I studied viruses that cause cancer. Um, like human papillomavirus, another virus called polyomavirus, but I didn't study coronaviruses. Um, I've met people who've studied coronaviruses. I've spoken to people who have studied coronaviruses. And this is my point in the beginning that I am not a coronavirus expert. I'm a virologist and I have a background in teaching science to general audiences. So um, the research that's been done and what I'm going to present today is really taken from a lot of brilliant men and women who are who have spent their careers working on this virus. So, uh, and I'm just gonna, I can't see something here. I'm just gonna move this out of the way, okay. I think we need to just start with, and I know you are all smart young men, but, and you know what a virus is, but I just really wanna hammer home what a virus is and isn't. So a virus is any large group of submicroscopic, and you should know that means really, really small, Infectious agents that are usually regarded as non-living, extremely complex molecules that typically contain a protein lipid violator. So that is another word for shell. Every virus has a shell. And that shell surrounds an RNA or DNA genome. So viruses either have a genome that's made of RNA or a genome that's made of DNA, two different genetic molecules. And they are capable of growth and multiplication only in living cells. So viruses are really not alive. Because if there weren't cells, there would be no viruses, right? They are organic molecules that can replicate and copy themselves if they have a replicate cell. So as I mentioned, every virus has a shell, okay? This is a protective coat. In scientific terms, we would call this either a capsid or an envelope. And that shell is designed to protect the genetic material which is the RNA or the DNA genome. So if you don't know what a virus is, right, and I'm sure you all know it, but just to get a sense, I like the Trojan horse analogy, right? So if you remember um, the Odyssey and, and, and Troy, right, the city of Troy, um, the virus is like a Trojan horse that wants to get into a cell, right? And it tricks the cell to letting it in and once the virus is inside the cell, it actually takes over the entire cell. And now it uses the shell's machinery to make more copies of itself so it can go infect other cells. Okay? So this is basically how viruses work. They trick the cell to let it inside. 
And once it's inside the cell, it takes over and replicates itself and makes more copies of the virus. All right, and now, most likely, most times, the virus has completely taken over the cell. It's gonna kill that cell so that the virus can spread to other healthy tissue and start the infection process all over, all right? Now, this is happening not just on a cellular level, but on a tissue level. So in the case of COVID-19, the SARS-CoV-2 virus is infecting many of the cells in your lungs so that your entire lungs can become inflamed. All right. And how the virus then spreads from one person to the other is that when you either breathe out or uh, spit out or, or touch mucus and touch your face and then touch somebody else, if a person is within six to nine feet of somebody who's infected, that person can breathe in a virus particle and become infected themselves. All right. And so this is how many viruses spread. The virus I demonstrated here in COVID-19 is spread through respiration, other viruses are spread through fecal oral, other viruses are sexually transmitted. But the idea is that the virus replicates in cells, which grows in the organism, which can pass from one organism to another. Now, before we talk specifically about the coronavirus, I wanna give you guys an understanding of the way that we talk about viruses. So the lay audience, means, meaning non-scientists, talk about viruses in either in terms of how they're transmitted, meaning how are they passed from one person to another, or their symptoms. Virologists categorize viruses in terms of their genetic composition, what is in their DNA, and gen, uh, DNA or RNA genomes. So here's an idea of if we're talking about viruses in terms of how they're transmitted, there would be respiratory, meaning you get the virus by breathing in particles from another person's breath or spit. Fecal oral means there's uh, some fecal matter that somebody didn't wash their hands after going to the bathroom and they shake hands with somebody. Sexually transmitted. Uh, some viruses are passed by getting a, a bitten by a certain bug. And then there are zoonotic viruses, which means you get them from an animal to a human. So here's some examples. A respiratory virus would be influenza or rhinovirus, which is a virus that causes the common cold. Uh, norovirus, if you've ever had a stomach virus, some people call it the stomach flu. It's, it's not a flu. Flu is an influenza virus. It's typically caused by a norovirus where you either get diarrhea or vomiting. Uh, sexually transmitted viruses are HIV, HPV, herpes. Uh, West Nile and dengue are, are two uh, viruses that are passed by mosquitoes. And then zoonotic animal to human would be things like rabies and lots of fever. If we talk about viruses just in terms of their symptoms, viruses that cause gastrointestinal systems would be norovirus or an adenovirus. Viruses that give you a rash or pox would be things like chicken pox or smallpox. Neurological viruses would be rabies and polio. Viruses that attack the immune system would be HIV and Epstein-Barr. And then viruses that infect the liver or give you liver inflammation, hepatitis B and C. But again, I want you guys to start thinking like virologists and, and when you might have some confusion over what you hear in the news, to clarify some of the things that are going on, you want you to start thinking about viruses, not in terms of symptoms and transmission, but in terms of their genetics, all right? And so all viruses can be grouped or categorized based on the composition of their genome, right? And the genome, again, is that genetic material, that blueprint information that is going to code all the proteins that are going to allow the virus to copy itself and infect cells. So many viruses such as uh, HPV, uh, herpes viruses, um, some hepatitis viruses have a DNA genome and that's shown in blue. And that DNA can come in different flavors, either one strand or two strand. We don't need to know that for today. Other viruses and many more viruses come in an or RNA virus flavor. So they have an RNA genome. And again, it can come in different flavors, positive strand, negative strand, double-stranded RNA. The virus that we're concerned about in this COVID-19 pandemic are known as coronaviruses, okay? And coronavirus is a single strand, means there's one strand of RNA virus, okay? And coronaviruses are a family of viruses. There's lots of different coronaviruses. So if you've taken biology, you know that 
um, the order of life is structured into uh, more, more and more specific categories. So the family of viruses is known as Corona Verde. And then there are four genuses. And within the genuses, there are different species of viruses. So the two I want to focus on are alpha coronavirus and beta coronavirus. So alpha coronavirus consists of viruses like the two listed here, 229E and NL63. If you've heard somebody said, well, coronaviruses can cause the common cold, they're talking about these two viruses. And most of us have had these coronaviruses when we were children. You typically get the sniffles, you recover in a few days. Beta coronaviruses are things like SARS, which is the virus that caused the pandemic in 2003. MERS is another pandemic that's been occurring in the Middle East. And the one that we're all aware of today, which is causing the COVID-19 outbreak, SARS-CoV-2. Now, I know this might be a little confusing, so I'm going to give you an analogy on how to think about how viruses are categorized. Here's something you're probably more familiar with. All right, here's a family tree of the feline family. Within the feline family, you have Panthera genus, which includes lions, tigers, and jaguars. You have lynx, you have pumas and cheetahs, and you have the felis, which includes jungle cats and house cats. They're all cats, but they're all different species of cats, right? And so this is a little Netflix joke. If you understand this, it's because you're a, a cool cat or kitten, all right? Sorry, little... Netflix from uh, Tiger King. Um, but this is how I want you to think about it, right? Here's the coronaviruses. They're all coronaviruses, but they're still very different within the same family. So think of the 229E and the NL63 viruses as cats, house cats. They don't really cause that bad of a disease. And your beta coronaviruses are like the lions, the tigers, and the... the, the um, panthers or jaguars of your viruses. These are really harsh viruses. They're similar, but they're different. And just a little nomenclature here. The name of the virus is SARS-CoV-2. The name of the disease that the virus causes is COVID-19. And an analogy that I hope is useful is HIV is the virus and the disease that is caused by HIV is AIDS. So when we say COVID-19, it means you have symptoms, um, you're coughing, you have a sore throat. The virus is SARS-CoV-2. That's the actual virus that's causing the disease. So coronaviruses have um, uh, a couple of parts, and the only parts we're going to focus, there's many more parts than this, but this is a simplified graph. They have a shell, okay, and that shell we call, in this case, an envelope. And on top of the envelope, it has a spike protein shown in yellow. And the spike proteins are the proteins that the virus uses to bind to the cell. And inside of that envelope covered by spike protein is the single strand, one strand of RNA. It's about 30,000 nucleotides long. As a reference, the human genome is 3 billion nucleotides long. This thing is only 30,000 nucleotides long. That's amazing to me because look how much havoc and devastation and, and death this 30,000 nucleotides has caused. It's amazing to me. All right. You probably all know this, but what are the symptoms of COVID-19, the disease from SARS-CoV-2? You get cough, shortness of breath, temperature. Some people are getting something called COVID toes where they get inflammation of the extremities. A minority of patients have a loss of smell or taste, and then some actually have gastrointestinal symptoms such as diarrhea. Um, this is a wonderful website that um, I took a screenshot of it yesterday. It's run by Johns Hopkins University School of Public Health. As of yesterday, there are 4.7 million confirmed cases and 316,000 deaths. Unfortunately, the U.S., uh, has more cases than any other countries and more deaths as well. And as you've probably heard, the older that you are, the higher the likelihood that you're going to die from this disease. So unfortunately, as you get up in age, particularly for those over 60, they have a higher likelihood of dying from the disease. And this has to do with two factors. One, as you get older, your immune system starts to work less effectively. And two, 
older people tend to have comorbidities. What do we mean by comorbidity? We mean by other diseases they have at the same time as having the virus. So this could be heart disease, this could be obesity, this could be diabetes. Um, the numbers here for 19 and under, no deaths. Unfortunately, that doesn't seem to be true anymore. Um, we could talk about this um, during the Q&A session, but there have been a few children and teenagers who have died from COVID-related disease where they're developing this weird inflammatory syndrome called Kawasaki-like syndrome a couple of weeks after being infected with the virus. And we're just now discovering this. So the one saving grace of this pandemic for a long time was that children didn't seem to get severe disease, but a very small percentage, it's still a minority of, of teenagers and children seem to be developing this weird inflammatory response to the virus. So let's talk about how this disease progresses. So let's say you're feeling great on day zero and you come in contact with somebody who's infected with the virus and you get infected, but you feel pretty good for five days, all right? So you get infected and for five days you think you're fine, but on day five you start developing a cough. This would be known as symptom onset. And then maybe you have a fever and a cough for seven days until you finally feel better. This would be known as symptom resolution, right? So what I would say here, if you've taken a math class, the average or more appropriate, the immediate, the median time that it goes from getting infected to developing symptoms is about five days. And the period from when you get infected to when you develop symptoms is known as the incubation period the period from the development of symptoms to when the symptoms are completely gone is known as the disease phase. Now, this would be a typical patient, but every patient experiences COVID-19 differently. So here's one patient that gets infected then doesn't develop symptoms for 14 days. So that would mean that this incubation period, the point at which you get infected with the virus to the point at which the virus shows itself in the form of this 14 days. That's why when they say you've been exposed to somebody with COVID-19, they ask you to quarantine yourself for 14 days because it could take that long to know whether or not you've gotten infected. Another person might get it, get symptoms the next day, and then be sick for weeks. So there's a lot of heterogeneity, variability in between people that get infected. Not everybody gets it the same. Some people get mild disease, and in fact, 80% or more of people who get this disease develop symptoms that are either barely recognizable or at least not severe enough to go to the hospital. Other people get sick, get hospitalized, and are in the hospital for months. Now, the, one of the problems with this disease is that when you, when you become infectious are not the same. So the period of when you're shedding virus that you can give to others is known as the communicability or infectious period. If you notice, this doesn't always overlap when you develop symptoms. So this is a danger zone, okay? Because you could be walking around feeling great, shedding virus, having no idea that you're sick and infecting other people. And this is why this virus has caused so much devastation because it's really hard without actually getting a test, it's really hard to know who's infected and who's not. And now we have these people who don't even ever get sick, they get infected with the virus, they shed virus, these are known as asymptomatic spreaders, and we have no idea when they're shedding virus, and they could be walking around infecting dozens of people. So this whole period is a danger zone. And if you wanna know why this pandemic is much worse than recent pandemics we've seen, this is the reason, all right? It's really not, I mean, yes, there's been terrible loss of life, but in terms of mortality of other viruses out there like Ebola and SARS, it's not that dangerous. What is dangerous is you can shed it to a whole bunch of people, particularly your grandmother and grandfather or your relatives that have comorbidities and never know it. And this is why this pandemic has been so challenging to deal with. So, a big question I get is, where did SARS-CoV-2 come from, all right? Now, 
I remember I learned Occam's razor from one of the brothers at Shamanad. I think it was an English class or it could have been a religion class. Occam's razor says this, the simplest solution is most likely the right one, right? So if you're looking at a problem, the one answer that's obvious is probably the answer. In medicine, doctors typically say when diagnosing patients, when you hear the sound of hoofprints coming down the hall, think horses, not zebras. So if somebody shows up and it looks like a heart attack, nine out of a 10 times or 99 out of 100, it's probably a heart attack and stop some sort of weird thing. Okay? So this is important because this is some misinformation that's spreading. Where did the virus come from? So this is a hypothesis, all right? And what I'm going to try to do with you guys is when I'm just going to state something that is not known 100%, I'll call it a hypothesis, or if I'm speculating based on my own training, I will let you know. The prevailing hypothesis, and this is a hypothesis held by 99.9% .9 of people who study viruses and 99.9% .9 of infectious disease doctors. That being said, there's still not 100% definitive proof, but this is the likely scenario. The scenario is that SARS-CoV-2 is a zoonotic virus, meaning passed from animals to humans. And the prevailing hypothesis is that the virus originated in bats and passed either directly to humans or from bats to a to be determined intermediate host. So maybe from bats to civets to humans or bats to pangolins to humans. That remains to be seen and we will figure that out. It just takes time. The evidence to support this hypothesis is pretty robust. One, the sequence of the virus is very similar to what we found in bats. So prior to 2019, there have been scientists both at the NIH in collaboration with scientists in China that were harvesting fecal samples from bats and looking for things that might cause problems down the road. And they found viruses that were very similar to SARS-CoV-2. So when SARS-CoV-2 popped up, they went into their freezers, they looked at the two viruses and said, well, this is a very close relative to what we found in bats, probably originated in bats and has evolved over time. The second important point is that the other coronaviruses in the beta coronavirus family, right? That's that lion, tiger, jaguar family of coronaviruses. SARS and MERS emerged from bats. And we know that with beyond a reasonable doubt. And finally, this has been going on for thousands of years. Most viruses that have caused pandemics, including swine flu, Spanish flu, Ebola, HIV, there's even some evidence to support that smallpox, which has been around for 3,000 years, came from camels. This has been happening throughout human history. What's special about now, even compared to 20 or 30 years ago, is that we are a globally integrated society and you could get from Wuhan, China to New York in 12 hours or 20 hours and easily spread the virus. And the, our population is so densely packed that the pandemic is much worse in terms of numbers and spread than these previous pandemics. So again, the beta coronaviruses, we know that the beta coronavirus SARS started in bats, moved to raccoon dogs, and civets, which are sold in the wet markets of China, and then eventually moved into humans and caused a very small pandemic. Only about 8,000 people were infected. MERS started in bats, moved to camels, and then has infected a few humans um, in the Middle East. And this is still an ongoing problem, but it doesn't spread as easily as the virus we're talking about for COVID-19. So science should settle most arguments. All right. And I, I don't want to, I have to do this because you're going to have family members who maintain, and I have family members who maintain that this is what's going on. The science says otherwise. So let's look at the two plausible scenarios. The most likely one is that this thing originated in nature. Some people say, well, it originated in a lab in China. There's no evidence to support that. It's very, very unlikely. That's not what the science says. The science says that it originated in nature. And the scientific evidence to support the nature we just went through, sequence of virus, history of similar viruses, pandemics like this have occurred before, lab accident data, little to none. And most of the indications that it could come from a lab are more intelligence-based, has nothing to do with the science, right? So when in doubt, trust the scientists. And if we want to use our analogy answer here, when you, 
walking down a hall or you, you hear hoof prints coming down the hall, think horse is not zebra. The most likely scenario here is, is nature, all right? The very rare possibility is lab accident. And I just want to add one other point. I will say with 100% certainty, although I can't prove this, but scientists have said it was not manufactured in a lab. It would be virtually impossible to manufacture a virus this effective in a lab environment. Nature is much smarter than we are. And we, even if we tried, would never be able to make a virus as pathogenic and as transmissible as this. So in that analogy, this is unicorns, because if you hear somebody says ma manufactured, it's make-believe. It's make-believe. That's just not what happened. It's the nature. It originated in bats, somehow passed to humans, maybe a farmer or at one of the wet markets, and it just started spreading once it evolved enough to move from human to human. So this is a question that came up. That student is very timely. Why is there such a large range in disease severity? Why is it that even within young people, and unfortunately, you know, for the most part, except for that Kawasaki-like syndrome, teenagers are fine, but men and women my age, I consider myself relatively young, I'm in my mid-30s, right? Why are some people in their mid-30s getting the sniffles and some getting on a respirator or worse dying? What's going on? Why is there such variability? Um, the answer is the immune system and that the immune system is different for each person, right? Just like your genetics are going to determine your height, your eye color, your skin color, your intelligence, yada, yada, yada. Genetics are also going to affect how your immune system responds to the virus. So we have to do a little bit of a immune system 101 to get into the weeds here of why this is happening. Um, so you have two arms of the immune system. You have your innate, the innate arm of the immune system and the adaptive arm of the immune system. So the innate arm is the first responder. These are cells that are first on scene to fight a virus or a bacteria or a fungus or a protozoan that have infected your body. All right. So their job is to scan for invaders and give the first wave of a response, the first defense. The amount, the adaptive immune system, their job is to mount a targeted response, a very specific response to that virus or bacteria after the innate system engages. So the innate system targets broad pathogens, meaning all different types of viruses and bacteria, where the adaptive immune response targets SARS-CoV-2 or tuberculosis. They're going to, like a heat-seeking missile, just target specific uh, pathogens. The innate immune system cannot learn from itself. It doesn't learn from past battles where the adaptive immune system does learn after you get infected with the virus or a vaccine, the adaptive immune system will become better at its job. So upon the second infection, it can get rid of the virus much faster. Important cells in the innate immune system are things like macrophages and neutrophils and adaptive uh, immune cells are things like T and B cells. Important molecules, well, the innate immune system is responsible for the inflama inflammatory response, and the adaptive immune system is uh, responsible for antibodies. And then the analogy here would be the innate immune systems like patrolmen or infantry, and the adaptive immune systems like a SWAT team or special forces. So what happens in coronavirus infection? And these numbers here are kind of made up. They're just supposed to illustrate a point. Um, and they're going to be variable from patient to patient. So let's look at a patient that had an effective and an appropriate immune response. So they get infected at day zero, the amount of virus in their system goes up, they get sick, and then it eventually comes down as they get better. And the reason they get better is because your innate immune cells are first on scene, they combat the virus, and then eventually your adaptive immune system, your B and your T cells and your antibodies kick in, they completely get rid of the virus. And now, in theory, you should be primed to uh, get rid of the virus if you're infected again because your adaptive immune system has learned. So here's an analogy, this targeted response. Three, nine, ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, All right, so the innate of an effective immune response, your immune cells are only going to get rid of those cells that are infected with the virus. It's going to leave the healthy tissue intact. 
what we think is going on in those severe cases of COVID-19, and this is one hypothesis shared by many physicians and scientists, is what's actually happening is you're having an overly aggressive immune response to the infection. So the virus comes in, it spikes, and your innate immune system turns on, but it stays on. And because it stays on, you get this hyper-inflammatory response. What they're seeing in patients that are hospitalized is that by the time they're hospitalized, it's really not a virus problem anymore. It's an inflammation problem where your immune system has gone haywire. So this is closer to sort of carpet bombing. Where the immune system gets rid of, oh, sorry. Back here. The immune system gets rid of um, the good and the bad cells in an aggressive immune response. And that's why people are getting this hyperinflammation in their lungs and difficulty breathing because their immune systems have really drastically responded. And I'm going to repeat this. Sorry, I'm just going to go through this. The final hypothesis, and this is probably going on too, and again, there's variability depending on your immune system, is that some people may not actually be combating the virus at all. So instead of getting not enough or too much immune system, they're not getting enough, and their adaptive immune system may not clear, uh, kick on, and they have this sustained virus response in their body. So under these circumstances, the viruses are just allowed to spread um, and go crazy in the lungs and cause a lot of damage. So how do we prevent this disease? Well, social distancing is what we're all doing now. Washing our hands, uh, eventually when you go out in public, wearing face masks and testing and tracing those that have been infected and the people that they've come in contact with. So really to open up the government, testing is gonna be really important. And I just want to remind people that and inevitably, if I see people outside without masks, and I'm not blaming you guys, but it seems to be teenagers who are not wearing masks, who are not social distancing. So even though the vast majority of teenagers don't get severe disease, you can still spread it as we've discussed to other people who are compromised. So as a sign of respect, wearing a mask is going to protect others from you. Um, unless it's an N95, uh, a mask doesn't really do much to protect you from getting the virus, but if you wear a surgical mask or a cloth mask, it will prevent you from shedding respiratory droplets to your neighbors. Um, testing has two flavors. Um, the first test tests for the virus. The second test tests for whether or not you've produced antibodies against the virus. So the virus test tests for genetic material where the antibodies uh, test for the immune response to the virus. The time scale is that virus testing will only work when you're infected and the antibody is gonna come after the infection. The virus test is gonna either take saliva or nasal swab or the antibody test is gonna test for blood. Um, and the analogy here would be the virus is like fingerprints left at a crime scene and the antibody is like police left to guard a crime scene. Questions and answers, the virus is gonna tell you whether or not you're infected now and the antibody test is gonna tell you whether or not you were infected before. Just to make this very clear, and this is unfortunate, although it will not stay true for long, there are currently no cures or vaccines for SARS-CoV-2. There are a lot of things in clinical trials, but there are no cures. There are no effective treatment other than just keeping people oxygen levels up and giving them fluids. There are, however, a lot of experimental treatments that are being developed. There are vaccines. There are antibodies or plasma, and then there are drugs. So if you don't know how a vaccine works, and I'm sure you all do, the way that a vaccine works is you infect a patient with vac a vaccine, and this vaccine is either going to be a particle of the virus or a virus that's dead. Your adaptive immune system, when you get a vaccine, is going to kick on, and it's going to create antibodies that can bind to the vaccine and neutralize the vaccine, kill the vaccine, so that when you actually get infected one day, with the real virus, these same antibodies that generated for the, the vaccine will also inhibit the virus from causing a severe infection. Uh, there are some discussions of antibody treatments. 
And anotrotic treatments is either taking the plasma, and this would be antibodies for patients that have recovered, because when you get infected with the virus, your immune system kicks on and generates specific antibodies. There's one thought that you can take those antibodies from a recovered patient and give them to an actively infected patient. Unfortunately, that's not very scalable. You would rely on getting blood donations from thousands of people, and those blood types would have to match. Not a great option, but they were, and they still are trying this early on because they're desperate. The other option is a company called Regeneron, which is generating manufactured antibodies, which are created in a test tube. So you can actually engineer a molecule that looks just like an antibody and then give that to patients. And there are at least two companies that are testing these antibodies as a therapy, but these are currently experimental. And there's some drugs being developed. Uh, there's one type of drugs that, or this is how the antibodies work. There's one type of drug that is going to block the ability of the virus to infect cells. And then there's another type of drug that even though the cell is infected, it's going to block the ability of the virus to replicate. Now, again, these are all experimental. They're in clinical trials, but this is the concept of how these drugs are being developed. And then we'll end on the concept of clinical trials, because it's important to know why this is going to take so long, why we won't have a drug or a vaccine in a matter of weeks. So clinical trials work as follows. First, you do what's called preclinical testing. You do testing in cells, you do testing in animals to see if it has some effect on the virus and to make sure that it's safe, right? You can do safety studies in animals first. The FDA will then approve it for testing in humans and you do something called a phase one trial which is a trial that um, just tests for the safety of the vaccine or the drug. It doesn't test whether or not the drug works. It just makes sure that when we give this to people, are they okay? Because if they're not, if it causes these horrible side effects where the cure is worse than the disease, that drug's not gonna be approved. So then you then give this drug in a phase two trial, okay? where you're testing whether or not it works in a small number of individuals. This is about 100 to 300 patients, sometimes smaller. If it works in a small scale, then you've got to scale it up to thousands of patients. This is called phase three. And if it works in phase three, if you could show that it either gets rid of the virus or prevents infection with the vaccine, it gets approved by the FDA, and then you're, you're clear to administer this drug to the general population. So let's get a sense of what development of a vaccine might look like, all right? So right now there are eight different clinical trials for therapeutic vaccines, um, a prophylactic vaccines, meaning that they're gonna prevent infection. And in a trial, you have to randomize your population. So you can't cherry pick saying, okay, I think you're gonna do better in the vaccine arm, so you go there and you're not looking so good, so you go to the placebo arm, can't do that. You gotta take everybody in the same pot, mix them up randomly and either give them the vaccine or give them the placebo. And the placebo is um, something that mimics the vaccine, but it isn't actually the vaccine. All right, so you deliver the vaccine, you check in with these patients for six months, midpoint check-in, see how they're doing. And then you study ends and you look to see how many people in the vaccine arm versus the placebo arm eventually develop COVID-19. And again, this takes six to 12 months. The reason this takes six to 12 months is because we have to wait for these people to go out in the world and get challenged and infected. This trial wouldn't work if you gave everybody the vaccine and then put them in a house for six months because they would never get infected. We have to see what happens when they go out in the world. Are they less likely to get infected or they're more likely to get infected? The example I give here is that the vaccine worked in this trial. Only a small percentage of people got infected, so the vaccine must be protecting people from the event. We also have to be prepared that these vaccines might not work. And we might see that, oh, okay, um, the vaccine didn't seem to protect people because the same percentage of people got infected in both the vaccine arm or the placebo arm. And one of the reasons we don't want to rush this vaccine, although it's rare, there is the possibility that the vaccine could actually make things worse. And there's a lot of complicated virology. If somebody wants to ask me that question, I will challenge it. But sometimes vaccines during the trial phase, and this has happened two or three times over the history of vaccine development. So it's not a frequent occurrence, but it has happened where we look at the people who got the vaccine and when they eventually got infected, they got worse. 
So we don't want to rush this and we don't want to be approving things in the general population that could make things worse. And it could actually cause some people to die, right? So this vaccine development, I'm confident will happen, but it takes time. And I want to make something perfectly clear. What I just mentioned, vaccines that can make things worse, there are no vaccines that have been approved and they would never be approved. This is going to be discovered during the trial phase. So there's a lot of anti-vaxxers out there that might see this slide and say, oh my God, see, I told you sometimes vaccines can make things worse. No vaccines that are given to the general population would ever do this. They would never get approved by the FDA. This is something that will be discovered early on in the trial phase. So I want to emphasize that science will solve this problem. All right. There are currently eight vaccine trials and over 144 therapeutic trials for either antibodies or different drugs, either new drugs or drugs that are already approved for something else. Science will solve this problem, but science takes time. And in the middle of a pandemic, we want to speed things up, but if we want to make sure people are safe and we, we know that these drugs are working. We need controlled, appropriately studied research. And Dr. Koons can tell you there's a reason it takes six years to get a PhD. It just takes time. It doesn't happen on our time scale. So I'll leave you with this and I'll take any other questions if you have them. When you guys get bombarded with COVID-19 information, whether it's some pundit or an expert, I, I want you to ask a couple of questions about that information you're receiving. First off, who is the source? What is their training? Um, if you see a homeopathic doctor or acupuncturist giving advice on COVID-19, I would take that with a grain of salt, okay? If it's an MD, MD, PhD, who's spent their whole career studying viruses, it's probably going to have more weight than somebody who doesn't have the appropriate training. Are they actively involved in the research enterprise? So do they have an experience conducting research? And if so, is it rigorous research? Is it, is it uh, applauded research that's um, reviewed by others? Can others verify their conclusions, right? So if they have some harebrained idea that really can't be tested, probably not that dramatic of a, a piece of information. Is the evidence they're providing based on anecdote or is it done in a peer reviewed, which means other scientists have reviewed the work before it's published and controlled, meaning there was a control group and a variable group, not just, hey, I gave everybody this drug and everybody got better. Well, how do you know if everybody got better because of the drug if you didn't have a control group? And finally, what are their motivations and in the, in their incentives? Do they have financial stake? Is it political? Unfortunately, there are some political motivations to push certain drugs. You have to ask yourselves, why would they be doing this? And finally, do they have the history of going against the grain? So some great resources for you guys. This Week in Virology, wonderful podcast that they uh, have this podcast two or three times a week that give general coronavirus updates. These are scientists that study coronavirus their entire career, Mark Dennison and Ian Lipkin. Ed Young, anything by him, wonderful uh, science journalist. The academic website that I showed you, Johns Hopkins, the NIAID, which is the, um, the arm of the NIH that studies infectious viruses in the one world. So living in unprecedented times, I know it stinks to have to go through school um, via Zoom. You all, many of you missed your Zoom, missed your sports, uh, missed your athletics, but I, I am confident we are going to get through this. Um, we just don't know when, but we will get through this and we're going to do so by getting through it together. So if, if you're feeling down, if you're feeling upset about all this, I would remind you to thank a frontline worker, see if you can volunteer online, donate your time or a little bit of money to uh, those in need who are not as uh, well off or really suffering from this pandemic. Um, grocery store workers, sanitation workers, healthcare workers, police, firemen, um, we wouldn't be here. It would, could be much worse without them.